Bookmark is presented in part by the Alabama Booksmith, located off Highway 31 in Homewood. The Booksmith is Alabama's BookSense.com bookstore, offering today's authors and thousands of signed books, including most Bookmark writers. William Gay of Tennessee is deeply read and self-taught. With Twilight, his fourth volume of fiction, he joins William Faulkner and Cormac McCarthy on the top shelf of Southern writers. I spoke with William Gay at the Alabama Booksmith in Homewood, Alabama. Well, Mr. Gay, you and I had a conversation in Fairhope about two years ago in which you agreed to sit down and have this talk. And now, here you are. <laughs> seems like uh, seems like only a couple of years to go, <laughs> and it's too late to back out. The uh, our audience, even if they have read some of your work, will not know much about you. The thing that people know is that you're from a piece of ground south of Nashville in Tennessee, and that's your home place. Where were you born? I was born there. It's uh, this a little town called Hornwald, Tennessee. It was settled by the. It was settled by the Swiss, and Hornwall means city of the high forest or something like that. And uh, I grew up there. That's where I went to school. When I got out of high school, I joined the navy. They had the draft back then, and mm -hmm. Vietnam was kind of shaping up, and I didn't want to be in the army, so I joined the navy. They said, uh, you get to travel a lot, which turned out to be true. Where'd you go? Ah, uh, Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mostly, mostly in the Orient, but I got, to live for, I got to live for a year in New York. Yeah, that was nice. They had a Brooklyn Naval Shipyard then, and I was stationed up there for a year. Did you return to Tennessee when you finished the Navy? Ultimately, I did. I, I didn't for a while. I, when I got out of the Navy, I had this idea that I was going to go live in New York. You know, I was going to mm -hmm. be the. I thought, in order to be a writer, you know, you had to you had to live in New York or somewhere. So, I try. I, I traveled around for a little while. I worked in Chicago. I worked some in New York, but I wound up going back home for a visit. And when I did, I I wound up staying there. For a long time. What did you do? How did you earn a living? Uh, I, w I was a, I was a carpenter. I started out working for a, for a really good carpenter as a helper. And down through the years, I learned, you know, I learned carpentry and hanging drywall, painting, that kind of stuff. I could always. There was always some way. If, if you knew several different, my idea was if you knew how to do several different things, you could always find a job, you know. So uh, I learned how to do a lot of stuff in the building trade. And you did that for 20 years, 25 years? Yeah, at least. But in the meantime, in the meantime, I had met this girl and we got married and we, I was raising kids. We had kids that... Mm -hmm. It came along, but uh, I was I was I was also writing all the time that I was doing this. You know, you I was I was working construction in the daytime and I was writing at night. Then I would type it up, you know, and send it off to New York. Did you yeah. ever send out a manuscript in handwriting? I, d I did that <laughs> when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. One of your characters does that, and he gets it back, and he's very disgusted with <laughs> with New York. Yeah, I had come up with a, with this perfect plot. I, I always read there was this magazine called Progressive Farmer, and they had uh, they ran fiction by Jesse Stewart and and people like that. Mm -hmm. Pretty pretty good stories, and they all seemed to be about uh, boys and their dogs or something like that. So I came up with this plot 
where this kid's dog is accused of killing sheep. But and there's this Romeo and Juliet thing going on yep. with two families that are feuding, and then uh, the dog saves somebody's life and they don't kill it. It's a sure thing. <laughs> How could it miss? It, you know, it reminded when I when I came to that particular bit, and that is in provinces, I think, isn't it? Yeah. I came to that, and it reminded me of the perfect country western song. You know that. Oh, that Steve Goodman, <laughs> yeah. Steve Goodman thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, pickup truck, passed through the ribbon, got out of prison, the whole the whole business. It was a perfect plot. Yeah, I was I was drunk the day my mom <laughs> got out of prison. That's it. I think John Pran helped him write that song. I think it was Steve Goodman and John Pran, maybe. And then this other guy put another verse to it. I'm not remembering his name. Yeah. Well, there you were, writing it down. David night. Allen Coe, that was his name. Yeah. When I when I when I read your collection of stories, I hate to see that evening sun go down, I looked at the credits, as people do. The earliest story in that collection is 98. The earliest credit is 98. Those stories were published between 98, 1998 and 2002, when the book came out. Had you been publishing before 98? Uh, no, 98 was, um, 98 was the year that things sort of fell together mm -hmm. or something. I think in February of that year, I got a call from uh, Georgia Review, a junior editor at Georgia Review. And I had had a story that had been there for, I think, 18 months. It had been there a long time. I practically oh. forgotten about it. And she asked me if I had written, was I the, was I the William Gay who, uh, actually my son answered the, the phone and he said, uh, he wasn't used to editors calling on the phone, you know, and he said, I think it's a bill collection. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was an editor from Georgia Review. And she said that uh, this guy, Stan Lindbergh, who was the editor of Georgia Review at the time, liked that story and wanted to publish it, but they'd lost it. And what I think had happened was that Stan Lindbergh was the only guy there who liked that story a lot. It was really rural, you know, it was, uh, it was not very, uh, which Modern story South was it? At all. It was, I hate to say, that evening sun go down, the title story. Title story. And uh, so I think they'd been hiding the story from Stan Lindbergh, and then he couldn't find it, so he made, he had somebody call me. But anyway, they went up buying the story, and a few months later, I sold the story to Missouri Review. And the fellow who bought the story at Missouri Review had a had a second job. He was an acquisitions editor for a small press, and he asked me if I had a novel. And uh, naturally, I did. And it was the long haul. Mm -hmm. was, uh, mm -hmm. was that? Well, I was interested in your. You, you have you have four books with four presses. Um, the first one, that small one. What was the name of the first press? Uh, McMurray and Beck. McMurray back and then. That's McAdam Cage. And now, now McAdam it's Cage, and in between. The same company. Oh, it is the same company. Yeah. But in between was the Free Press and Double Random Day. House. Double or Day. Double Day. Yeah. Why, why, why were you moving around? Is there any reason to that? Well, I got an agent after uh, the first story was published, and she didn't want to stay with a small press. It was her idea, you know, to mm -hmm. send a manuscript around and have like an auction, you know, mm -hmm. take the take the the best price, and um, so it wound up being Doubleday, and I my editor at Doubleday was this woman named Amy Shab, and we worked really well together on Provinces of Night, but then she got fired or she got a better job or anyway she moved on and she went to Free Press, and she asked me did I want to go too and. Yeah. Since I was used to working with her, uh, we just both went like a package deal, you know, yeah. we both went to free press. That happens. People do follow a good editor. Your, your setting, your place, this, this section of Tennessee, which is now is becoming better known after four volumes about it, in the center of it is the hurricane. Nobody knows what that is until you explain it. What, what is that 
blown over, tormented piece of land that people hide in and escape to? It was, uh, originally it was uh, a lot of company land, thousands of acres of land that belonged to a mining company. And they had uh, their man for iron ore back about the turn of, back about 1890, early, mm -hmm. early to early 1900s, they, uh, and there were all kind of people that lived there, you know, there were, it, it was almost, it was almost like a town, but then when it became unprofitable maybe to, or they ran out of iron ore or something, the company moved out and the people eventually moved out too because there was no way to make a living, you know, without the, without the mines. And the, the idea that Harrigan, I had heard people say, when I was growing up, I'd heard people talk about the year that Harrigan came through, and it was like a, a tornado probably, but they called it a hurricane. And it, it, you know, it blew away houses, blew down trees, and in my, li in my little hurricane, the trees are, are blocked roads, you know, hardly anybody lives there, and the people that do live there have grown steadily more eccentric and, and kind of isolated and weird. It's, it's um, isolated, and it is other and it's separate, but it is not Eden. It is a, <laughs> it is a raw, rough place. It's not like some island in the Pacific that you would imagine. It's, it seems as if people there just go down. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's definitely not Eden, but um, I don't, the people who are there, I don't think are terribly different from people I knew when I was growing up. I don't mean the, the, the violence or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, just, I mean the lives, the lives that they live, the things that they mm -hmm. say. I, I was always a, a good listener and people say funny things sometimes, you know, and you remember them and then later you use them. Well, let me ask you about that. I suspect that p your readers and people who, who know a little bit about your work the first thing that they're going to say, the first thing that's going to come to their mind if they're asked to describe your work, they're going to talk about it's about violence and darkness. But before we go there, some of that, some of your novels are loaded with really ridiculous, funny, um, sometimes pretty violent, nevertheless, but funny humor. How do you, how would you characterize the humor? I, I know what I think about it, but uh, what do you for, think about it? Well, I think that it's at, uh, it's not exactly Catskill stand-up humor. You know, it's it's raw, it's physical humor. The man puts the man puts a hog in the back seat of his car, for example. I just thought that was funny. I, I do I too. Know. I thought the whole idea. Of, <laughs> I thought the whole idea of painting a barn roof for a lady who paid you with a hog. I just thought that was a funny idea. And then once he had the hog, he had to, you know, he didn't want to cut his losses entirely, so he was going to, he was going to take the hog, and all he had to haul it in was the car. But he is a fool, that guy. I guess, but um, I kind of like the guy, you know. I, the the fools, or if you want to characterize them like that, like Motormouth and Albright. Mm -hmm. Albright, yeah. Yeah, I think I see a lot of myself in, in some of those guys, you know, because I've done some, I've done some pretty stupid things too. <laughs> well, it although I never got paid with a hog. It reminded me, no, no, I and don't. It reminded me of Spotted Horses, and that brings us to some place that I think we can spend a minute, and that is during those twenty, twenty-five years, I'm certain you did a lot of reading. And I'm certain that Faulkner constituted a part of that reading. Yeah, I've always done a lot of reading. I had uh, when I was in the when I was in the seventh or eighth grade, I had a I had a school teacher who noticed that I read a lot. Mm -hmm. But I was reading um, things like Zane Grey westerns and mm -hmm. Perry Mason mystery novels and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And he. Uh, he gave me uh, Look Homer, the Modern Library edition of Look Homer and Angel and said, read this, and then 
tell me what you think about it. And this blew me away, you know, I'd never read, I never read anything like that, the language, the rhetoric that Wolf used. Mm -hmm. And it was like, uh, it was like Wolf could see inside my head or something, you know, it was like, uh, he was aware of my experience by the act of making me aware of his experience or something, you know, it was, it, it was really weird. But then, uh, the same guy gave me uh, the sound and the fury, and that uh, that I didn't know I didn't get the book. You know, I, I, I didn't really understand everything about it. But the language, the the way that Faulkner wrote, affected me. And then I then I read as I lay dying, and Faulkner. Uh, I had this I had this thing about Oxford. You know, I was because I'd read. After I read all the way through Faulkner, you know, I read the biographies of him, and there was all this stuff about Oxford in there, and and Oxford became almost like a mythological place. You know, it, it seemed larger than life. You know, just because because Faulkner had been there, and then uh, about the time that a good man is hard to find came out, I discovered Flannery O'Connor. Mm -hmm. And I think probably her stories are as big an influence on my stories as anything else because I think she was, I think she wrote the best short stories that probably any American writer has ever written. What about Cormac McCarthy? Does he figure in at all? Yeah, I think McCarthy's probably the best writer alive mm -hmm. right now. And, and I, read, um, I read The Orchard Keeper I read them in order. I read The Orchard Keeper, and then I read, you know, as they came out. Right. And Child I was a God member of that. So, uh, for a long time, there was this McCarthy cult. Yeah. You know, there were, his books would come out like Blood Meridian sold 1,200 copies in hardcover when that book came out. He wasn't selling any books, but but he was developing this fanatic yeah. cult, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. I was part of that. And then in 92, or whenever it was, all mm -hmm. the pretty horses came out, and that right. it was a bestseller, and right. made all the difference, and all that. I sort of think that McCarthy and uh, Charles Fraser made it easier for me to get published because I was mm. I was sending stuff out, and it was coming back, and Southern writers, there weren't many Southern writers around. There was Barry Hanna, mm -hmm. and. Uh, William Styron, and, and, but he was really more of a, you know, like a Virginia guy. Mm -hmm. But there's not a lot of Southern fiction, and then uh, All the Pretty Horses won the National Book Award, and it, it was a bestseller, and then Cold Mountain came along, and I think publishers started looking at Southern writers mm -hmm. maybe in a little different, little different fashion. Well, whatever sells a lot, they want more of it. So yeah, they can sell a lot of the new. Publishers are gamblers, you know. They they they're like uh, they're like record like the record business, you know. Mm -hmm. They gamble a lot on one thing, and then if it doesn't work, they cut their losses and go on to the next thing. Let me. I can see. Um, I mean, I not not in a, a a shadowy way, but I can see some Wolfe and some Faulkner and some McCarthy and some Flannery O'Connor, but you have a vocabulary, and I'm willing to say that there are words in your novels, in your fiction, that don't exist in, in any of those other writers that I never have laid eyes on. In fact, I may never have laid eyes on some of those words anywhere. What, what, what did you, how did that come about? Where did those words come from, literally? Did they come from reading? Did they come from a thesaurus? Do you read the dictionary before you go to bed at night? What, what's it about? No, I don't, uh, I don't read the dictionary <laughs> that much. And uh, I don't look things up in a thesaurus either, you know, to find, you know, to, to find the right word. When I'm writing and when it, uh, when it seems to be working, I just write what I think, mm -hmm. you know. But the words are that's in there somewhere. Very, that's not a very good explanation. Well, but, but the, the, they're very the exotic words. Reading, 
they, they come from reading yeah. because I've read all my life uh -huh. and from the time I was really young. And I didn't only read fiction, you know, I read mm -hmm. uh, whatever I was interested in at the time. Yeah. So you pick up, you pick up words, you know, and, and you, I like, you pick up more than most people, though. I like, <laughs> when you're looking for a certain word, another word won't do, you know. You have to have yeah. the precise, the precise word that expresses whatever it is that you're you're trying to yeah. trying to cite. Yeah. Or at least that's what I think. Ah, I, I think it's unimpeachably true. It's just that it, it's. It's uncanny to be reading along and, and see in, a, in one page two or three words that you may not have seen in print before if in 10 years, if ever. But they're there, and they're right. I mean, there's not a question about their being right. It's a question of where they came from. Yeah, the problem I have with words, the one problem is that I, I fall in love with the word, and I use it too much. And then the editors have to say, you used mall <laughs> six times so far in this chapter or something. I have a quick little question about about the setting. Not not the setting in place, but the setting in time. I seem to... I, tell me if you think this is right. Most of the fiction of yours, see, most of it seems to be set in the 40s and 50s. During the Second World War or... In, eh, maybe even up into the early 60s, but you're not messing around much in the 90s, and there are a few bits, but mostly you you like that post, well, there's a little, little bit in the 20s and then a lot in the 40s. Is there something about that <clears throat> kind of an earlier age, or was the place more isolated? Why do, why do you think you're hanging in there in the 40s and 50s? I think a, l a lot of this stuff, some of the <coughs> some of the short stories are contemporary. Yeah. You know, some of the stories yeah. take place, you know, like yesterday or something. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of the stuff that I write about wouldn't work if you said it in the nineties. Right. The characters wouldn't be right because uh, the South, the South seems to have changed so much since. Well, I kind of mark it with the advent of television, you know, when mm -hmm. everybody got TVs and mm -hmm. everybody could see into everybody else's living room, you know, and, and everybody wanted to be like Leave it to Beaver or something and <laughs> things got more homogenized or something and some of those plots wouldn't work. Some of the, some of the things that I write about would, would work fine, you know, in the 50s and in the 40s, but uh, they, they just don't work in the 90s. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, you need the dirt roads, you need the isolation, you need the, the pockets of people out there in the middle of uh, Tennessee. The new book, Twilight, <clears throat> and this is, there, there are, it's a kind of a mystery, but I don't think it's a whodunit. I mean, there are two kinds of evil in this book. This is an exploration of, <laughs> of kinds of awfulness. There's the awful undertaker, who is perverse and evil in his way, and then there is Sutter, who is a kind of a reprise of Hardin in a way. And I'm and and I'm interested in 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 your understanding of evil. Is it you know, where does where where does stuff like Hardin and Sutter where do those people come from? Are they born that way? Is evil, is, is everybody evil and some people just exercise it? I mean, tell me about about where the meanness or the evil comes from. I never really thought in those that people. much about that. I, I think uh, the people who are really evil are born that way. I they are. They, they're evil from the, time, <laughs> from the time they're little evil babies, you know, until they, <laughs> until they grow up. But um, in the first book, in the long home, I had this idea about evil, which which Hardin represented, and the, yeah. and the idea of the book was that if evil exists in the world, then there's got to be somebody who sort of rises up to oppose it. Yes, and that was William Tell Oliver. Oliver was the guy. Right the only guy who stepped up to the plate, you right. know, when, when Hardin was getting 
out of hand. And he was an old man without yeah. too many resources. He had a... There's a quality about those old men that, that I saw in the South. This goes back to what you said about the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. There's a, a kind of stoicism about people, you know, even when these old guys, you know, they would tell you all these horrible things that had happened to them. You know, their life was like one hardship after another. And they had a sense of humor, you know. They could, they could even be funny about it. Like... Uh, like a lot of old blues songs, you know, have humor to them, or old mm -hmm. country songs, that, that yeah. Harry Smith stuff that came out in the 20, 28, 29, yeah. stuff like that. Those people had a sense of humor. Well, that's not a happy ending, but it is an ending. It's, it's an ending. <laughs> and it'll serve as our ending. I thank you very much. This has been a, 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 a really uh, unusual conversation because I, I, I've learned a lot about you and your work. And, and uh, I'm glad to know it. Well, so, I appreciate you having me on. and uh, Thank you for your time. Sorry it took two years and to do And the talk. copy of the show on videotape or DVD, or to purchase a book by one of the featured writers, call 205-870-4242 or email booksmith at mindspring.com. Bookmark is presented in part by the Alabama Booksmith, located off Highway 31 in Homewood. The Booksmith is Alabama's booksense.com bookstore, offering today's authors and thousands of signed books including most bookmark writers.